Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part two of designing and operating roads for the aging population. My name is Mike Fitch with the Ohio LTAP Center here at ODOT, and we appreciate your participation. As we mentioned on Tuesday, please feel free to use the questions box to send in any questions you might have during the presentation. Looking at the handouts section of the GoToWebinar panel, please note also that a PDF copy of the course presentation is available for reference. With that, we will go ahead and turn things over to Mark Doctor. Hello. Hey, Mike. Thank you, and welcome back, everybody. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully most people were able to join us on, on Tuesday. Uh, but uh, if not, if for some reason you missed Tuesday, that is okay. Uh, much of what we're going to uh, cover today you know, builds on what we talked about, but it is you know, okay to be joining us uh, now if uh, if you missed uh, Tuesday. Uh, if you uh, did miss it, we, we started off uh, with a discussion about why we have this workshop and uh, why the focus on designing and operating roads for the aging population. And it's really a, an amazing demographic uh, shift where we are an aging society. And then we talked about the typical age-related diminishing capabilities uh, for drivers and also uh, pedestrians. It gives us insights into what we as transportation practitioners uh, can do to make our roads safer and um, especially uh, accounting for some of these age-related diminishing capabilities. And then we jumped right in to looking at some of the recommendations that come from the FHWA handbook for designing for the aging population. And intersections is a large part of that uh, handbook, the most recommendations related to intersections. And we talked about uh, why intersections are so challenging. So this afternoon, we're gonna continue with the remaining intersection related recommendations that are in the FHWA handbook. And then there is a portion of the handbook that talks about implementation and the considerations for implementing these recommendations. And also there's an assessment example that we'll walk through. And then we'll close out this afternoon's session with some of the recommendations that are related to freeway interchanges. And then lastly, roadway segments. So that's the agenda uh, for this afternoon. Again, I'm Mark Doctor with the Federal Highway Administration's Resource Center, and uh, glad everyone uh, came uh, to participate in this afternoon's uh, session. So we did finish the design-related subcategories for intersections on Tuesday, and now we're going to get into signs, markings, and lighting signals, and pedestrian crossings. So there are many recommendations in there that are related to signing, markings, and lighting. Some of them quite simple, uh, things like uh, providing an advance street name plaque on an intersection warning sign or to use advanced street name signs. This basically gives the older driver more time to, well, first recognize that the intersection that maybe they want to turn on ahead is, is approaching and give them more time to make an appropriate lane change, perhaps get into the left turn lane uh, to uh, make a left turn at the intersection that's uh, approaching. And a general recommendation for larger letter sizes, so for street name signs, uh, placing them overhead. Uh, sometimes uh, agencies uh, go with the internally illuminated uh, signs, not a requirement, but a nice added uh, feature for better visibility, especially at night. Uh, so general recommendations for overhead and larger lettering street name signs. Also, uh, the possible use of larger lane control signs placed uh, overhead at a uh, preview distance that's commensurate with the operating speed to again give drivers adequate opportunity to recognize what lane they should be in as they're approaching the intersection uh, with relation to uh, route guidance, uh, but also the lane assignment of the intersection. Other strategies include putting pavement markings, supplemental 
pavement markings for conditions like a stop ahead or signal ahead or yield ahead. These are optional, uh, but they are uh, described in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control uh, Devices and uh, particularly uh, in a rural area might be advantageous. Just gives added conspicuity to the fact that there is an intersection ahead and a, a traffic uh, control uh, device uh, ahead. Another way to increase the, the conspicuity, the visibility of traffic control devices at intersections is the use of reflective sheeting on the sign support posts. This is an option. It is uh, described in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or MUTCD. It's not required, but it is uh, certainly permissible and is becoming a more common practice uh, around the country. Just helps the signs uh, stand out more at, at night in particular, obviously, but uh, just give that added target value. And for the delineation of curves and, and edge lines, especially things like uh, median islands or other raised features, there are all kinds of enhancements that uh, can be made depending on the, the context and, and the conditions. Something as simple as painting the raised curbing and, of course, maintaining that. Uh, sometimes we see the curbs painted initially as part of a project, but then uh, not uh, maintained or painted. So uh, certainly when, when these added enhancements are made, uh, there is a, a, a commitment that should be uh, placed on, uh, on maintaining them as well. But in addition to just painting, which, which does go a long way, it's really surprising how much added target value uh, some, uh, some painting of the curbs can provide, but also perhaps things like raised pavement markers, reflective pavement markers on the outlines of the raised curbing and channelization or delineation posts. All of these things just help, let's say, a median island uh, stand out. And lighting, uh, intersection lighting in particular, if we have a condition perhaps where the lane alignment shifts. Uh, also, if we have nighttime pedestrian volumes, uh, intersection lighting can be very, very important uh, for uh, for the safety of all users, but in particular, uh, the, the vulnerable uh, users. And then traffic signals, two basic recommendations related to increasing the visibility of traffic signals and the left turn signal phasing with a general recommendation for protected only, and we'll talk more about that coming up. But traffic signal head visibility, now, the MUTCD gives you the, the basic minimum requirements, but the use of supplemental heads uh, is, is really what the FHWA handbook is referring to. So in this picture is a great example of basically a signal head per lane, and this is a six lane arterial, three lanes in each direction with dual left turn lanes, a right turn lane, uh, so basically a signal head per lane uh, and uh, the, the use of, of these supplemental uh, signal heads just helps uh, helps them become more visible. Now, these do not have the retroreflective back plates, but that is a, another way to, to make a signal head uh, stand out. But also approximately located in the center of the lane where a motorist is most likely to see them. On horizontal curves, sometimes supplemental heads are placed uh, post-mounted uh, because as you're coming around a turn, coming around a curve, a driver perhaps can't see the main signal heads that would be most visible at the stop bar. But on the approach to the intersection, a supplemental head uh, that is visible on the approach uh, so that uh, when, when someone's making the, the, the approach and making that turn, well, that's, that's when the main signal heads uh, then become visible. Backplates with retro-reflective borders, one more strategy to help make the, the signal head more visible, have, help it stand out, if, obviously at night uh, in particular. Now, there's another advantage uh, that the backplate can 
provide at night. And if you look at the photo on the left-hand side of this slide, you see two signal heads, one with a retroreflective border, one without. And there is a portion of the population that uh, does have uh, a, a visual impairment related to uh, uh, colors, the ability to, uh, to, to discern colors, color blindness to, to various uh, degrees. And the, uh, the, the green uh, color is, is one of the more common uh, challenges for, for people with this uh, impairment. Uh, so oftentimes there's a little bit of blue added to, added to the light. Uh, but at night, and especially in cases where you've got other lights, non-signal uh, non lights uh, that are maybe in the background, having that border, having that retroreflective border gives a perception of which ball is illuminated. So the green ball being at the bottom, red ball being at the top. Well, if you didn't have that border to kind of give a, a sense of perspective, uh, it would be ha very hard for someone with uh, color blindness to, uh, to perhaps discern is that the green light or a red light. So one added value of that uh, retroreflective border on a backplate serving another segment of the population. Protected only left turn signal phasing, the uh, ability to make a left only on a green arrow. Uh, we have choices with regard to left turn signal phasing. We could have permissive only, where uh, left turns are made when there's a gap in oncoming traffic. That can be something like a green ball or the flashing yellow arrow, or a combination of protected and permissive, where perhaps there's a green arrow that uh, starts the, uh, the, the signal uh, cycle, uh, and then a permissive phase where when gaps permit, uh, left turning vehicles uh, may operate. But as we mentioned on Tuesday, one of the challenges for older drivers, one of the skills that diminish is judging for those gaps in oncoming traffic. Uh, the, the motion, the perception of the relative speed of an approaching vehicle, all of those are, they're, they're challenging for folks at any age. Um, the, the, the size of an approaching vehicle doesn't really start to get noticeably much bigger until the vehicle is, is relatively close in. Uh, it's really not until that uh, car, the approaching car, you say within, a, within 500 feet of your view, that you really start to see a difference in the in the the appearance the size of the image of that oncoming car uh, and so making those judgments about well how fast is that car coming and it, how far away are they those judgments which is both mental and visual uh, that uh, diminishes as we age and so the permissive left turn is a particularly uh, is, is a true issue for older driver safety at intersections. So the protected left turn, uh, which uh, does have much better safety performance, uh, just uh, revising the traffic control strategy at a signalized intersection, perhaps going from uh, permissive or a protected permissive to a permissive only operation generally provides a substantial safety benefit, but particularly to the aging population. So these are tough decisions that agencies are, are, are making uh, with regard to the choice of left turn signal phasing. Now, many times uh, the factors that go into consideration are things like the number of left turn lanes, and most agencies will choose to go with protected only, the, the green arrow, uh, when they have two or more left turn lanes. Now that's not a requirement. There are some agencies, especially uh, as you head out west, uh, that do operate permissive left turns, even with two left turn lanes. Uh, if you've ever been to the, uh, Denver, Colorado and, and some of the uh, suburban cities around Denver, uh, many do operate dual left turn lanes 
with uh, permissive. But at least on the East Coast, most states and most local agencies, uh, as a matter of practice, will say if we have two or more left turn lanes, that uh, that would trigger protected only. Another consideration is how many opposing through lanes, how many lanes are, are coming at a, a left turning vehicle. And uh, if it's three or more op opposing lanes or approaching lanes on, on the uh, opposing approach, uh, many agencies will choose that as a trigger for going with uh, a protected only, or sometimes two approaching lanes is enough. It, it, it really is a, a judgment call and speed is another important consideration not just the the posted speed but the true operating speeds and uh, under higher speed conditions there is less of that ability to uh, to make those uh, those difficult judgments of, about gaps uh, in oncoming traffic so all of these things uh, the, the sight distance yesterday we are sorry on tuesday we talked about offset left turn lanes in this photo, you see negative offset. You see a case where that uh, vehicle that's in the left turn lane on the opposite side, they're blocking our view of oncoming traffic. So all of these are important considerations. So making that protected only left turn phasing, uh, how many left turn lanes are there? If it's two or more, most agencies will go protected only. How many through lanes are on the opposing approach? Uh, most agencies would, would say four, well, three or more, but some do have four or more uh, and, uh, as the trigger to go protected only, but you could go with uh, three or more or even two or more. The speed, if the 85th percentile operating speeds or the, uh, the speed limit on the opposing approach is uh, 45 miles an hour or greater, uh, sometimes that's a trigger for going to protected only. And then certainly sight distance. If we have that uh, negative offset, uh, that can be a, a big deciding factor to go with protected only. And then overarching all of those other factors is the crash experience. And if we have a location uh, that has experienced uh, crashes, especially from those permissive left turns, well, another uh, potential reason to consider a change and going protected only. The sight distance is something that is obviously going to be very intersection by intersection specific. It uh, is dependent upon the oncoming, the, the speed of oncoming traffic. So the handbook does give some guidance on what that minimum sight distance to oncoming vehicles should be. And whether it's a, a negative offset or positive offset uh, will influence what the actual sight distance is, but speed of approaching vehicles is certainly a uh, part of it. And note that uh, permissive left turn phasing is generally not suggested when the speed of opposing traffic exceeds 45 miles an hour. And then three recommendations related to pedestrian crossings. The clearance time. So with the onset of a walk uh, indication, the, uh, the, the uh, at a pedestrian signal head, and then when the countdown and the, the flashing hand, that's the pedestrian change interval or the, uh, the, the part of the time that is needed for a pedestrian that uh, let's say has just entered the crosswalk. So perhaps they, they've just stepped off the sidewalk, uh, they've just initiated the crossing maneuver, and the calculated time for the pedestrian to make it to the other side. So in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, uh, there is guidance that uh, says where we have uh, a, a population that is likely to walk slower than the minimum three and a half, I'm sorry, maximum uh, three and a half feet per second. That's the maximum assumed pedestrian walking speed, but not all pedestrians walk at three and a half feet per second. 
So a lower assumed pedestrian walking speed, a slower walking speed uh, can be used. And so the handbook recommends a three feet per second pedestrian walking speed when, when determining what an appropriate clearance interval should be. Part of that is the, uh, the countdown uh, of, a, uh, of a flashing hand at the uh, crosswalk. And also to, to measure that crossing distance from a location that's six feet back from the curb. And oftentimes that is a, about where the call button might be located, the pedestrian push button, but also it's a distance back where a, a pedestrian is not uh, just standing right next to uh, traffic. So getting a, a little bit of, of comfort with a buffer so make an assumption that they're standing six feet back from the curb. And then when they are clearing the crosswalk, that uh, they make it all the way uh, to the other side. So it, subtle details, but important details. Another recommendation is the use of a leading pedestrian interval, which is also becoming more and more popular and more commonly implemented. So in the picture here, you also see the leading pedestrian interval that's giving the pedestrian the walk indication, allowing the pedestrian to claim the crosswalk, to, uh, to establish presence uh, in the crosswalk before the vehicular movement is given a green light to, to proceed. And the right turn, you see the, the blank out sign for a no right turn on red. Uh, that no right turn on red sign would, would go blank when the signal turns green. Now that uh, blank out sign is not a requirement to implement a leading pedestrian interval. It, it's, a, it, it's an enhancement uh, just to uh, add that reinforcement of uh, trying to allow the pedestrian to get a head start on crossing and uh, cl uh, claim their their spot in the crosswalk. Uh, this this can be particularly advantageous, uh, perhaps where aggressive drivers at an intersection uh, may try to make a right turn uh, in front of a pedestrian that is uh, starting to cross at the crosswalk. If there's high right turn volumes and aggressive driving behavior sometimes so that uh, can occur and the leading pedestrian interval uh, especially with a blank out sign uh, a possible a strategy to to help in that regard but certainly for older drive uh, older pedestrians uh, gives them also that opportunity to uh, get a head start before uh, traffic starts moving high visibility crosswalks and as the name implies, it's really about the better visibility uh, for a driver that's approaching the, uh, the crosswalk. If you think about what a driver sees as they're approaching, and this is particularly uh, advantageous for a mid-block uh, pedestrian crossing, but certainly at, at intersections uh, as well. So use of a high visibility crosswalk uh, just to have that added conspicuity. So those are the array of intersection treatments that come from the FHWA handbook. We can categorize them into design, signing, marking, and lighting, signals, and pedestrian crossings. So with that, let me take a pause. And uh, Mike, let me just do a check to see if we have any questions that may have come into the chat pod. Yes, thanks, Mark. Uh, first, we have a comment from Nick who said, advanced street name signs are severely lacking at roundabouts. Ah, yeah, yeah. So that, um, <laughs> that, uh, that is an interesting observation. So yes, just like uh, any uh, intersection at, at roundabouts as well, uh, we do have the option for advanced uh, street name signing and uh, whether it's conventional or also uh, roundabout signing that uh, also includes some of the sort of like a, a diagram of uh, where uh, what, especially if there's a difference in the street name 
I say for the right turn versus the left turn. But yes, there certainly uh, is an opportunity to provide uh, advanced street name signs uh, on the approach to, uh, to roundabouts as well. And for multi-lane roundabouts, there's that added uh, importance of having good lane assignment signing uh, on, on the advance. So yes, excellent point. Thanks, Mark. And Jenny mentioned uh, great input regarding the LPI. Ah, good, good. Yes, the LPI is certainly uh, gaining in popularity, and we're really pleased to see more and more agencies uh, implementing uh, the leading pedestrian interval. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right, Mike. Thank you very much. So next, I want to talk about... Uh, when to implement these uh, recommendations. Some of the recommendations are sort of uh, those that uh, could be utilized broadly, say uh, applied systemically, but many are, are not. Uh, many are things that you probably would not want to uh, implement uh, system-wide. Uh, and, and so knowing when to, uh, to implement is, uh, is important. So the handbook does give some advice. It does give some guidance on uh, when to uh, consider uh, the, these recommendations. It starts with a process of looking at the, the location or the context of whether it's an intersection or, or a roadway segment. And it asks four questions. And if the answer to any of these four questions is yes, well, then that sort of triggers uh, the next uh, step. So the questions are, is there a demonstrated crash problem at this location with aging road users? And the second question, has any aspect of the design or operation of the project been associated with complaints, uh, especially from aging road users? Has your phone been ringing off the hook? Or are you uh, bombarded with uh, emails complaining about a certain location or issue, and uh, especially uh, from uh, older uh, users. The third question is about the uh, location, perhaps being on a origin destination link uh, that uh, that is more heavily used by uh, aging persons, something like a, a senior center or a, a senior living uh, facility. Those are some obvious examples of, uh, of land uses that might, uh, uh, might trigger uh, a desire to uh, implement uh, some of these features. And then lastly, is the project located in a census tract or a zip code designation uh, that we know to have a high proportion of uh, older residents? So really, if the answer to any of these four questions is yes, it sort of triggers the next step, and that is to identify which treatments are most applicable for the conditions uh, that we have. So we talked so far about intersections, and so go through and uh, kind of make an assessment about whether the recommendation would be applicable, what the expected benefit would be, uh, or uh, especially uh, does it differ from local uh, current practice? Uh, many times uh, the, the current practice might already integrate those features. So then the last step is to make a decision on implementation. So these checklists, these uh, worksheets are found in the FHWA handbook and uh, they can help in terms of uh, walking through this process and uh, also uh, maybe assist in providing documentation as to why certain features were added uh, into a project. So let's go through a hypothetical example. And uh, we, we've got a divided four lane highway and excuse the, 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 the rough uh, graphic, it's uh, my, my low budget operation here, but it's a four lane divided highway uh, in in a, a, a suburban or a rural transitioning to suburban type of uh, context, we are approximately 1.2 miles from the Statesville senior living community, the little uh, little town of Statesville, and a senior living community that uh, 
uh, that is located about a little over a mile away down this four lane divided highway. Uh, currently on the corner with uh, Wheeler Road and, and Wheeler is a, a minor street that's uh, stop controlled on Wheeler. Uh, currently no control on the four lane divided highway. And uh, there's a fast food burger place and a gas station uh, on the corner. There's a big parcel across the street that uh, is currently uh, for sale. There's the uh, Big Buffet Family Restaurant uh, just beyond that intersection with Wheeler. And a announcement for the construction of a new big box super center uh, was, was recently made. And so the, uh, the big box super center, uh, let's say they are going through the uh, permitting process and uh, part of what uh, what we is our is the local transportation agency well there is a request for a traffic signal uh, a new traffic signal to serve the uh, new development coming in the big box super center and uh, that uh, intersection this new intersection would also tie in to the existing driveway on the opposite side of the street for the, the Big Buffet family restaurant. So that's the scenario, that's the request for this new uh, signalized intersection, and it's only 300 feet away from the uh, current stop controlled uh, Wheeler Road. So you, you may have uh, encountered a scenario uh, like this uh, at some point. Uh, and uh, so let me take a, a, a pause here and uh, so if, if you think about applying the recommendations in the handbook, or if you think about the, uh, uh, the process that we just went through, the, the four uh, questions uh, that, that may trigger, well, we do have that senior living uh, community. And yeah, it's very probable that uh, uh, that senior living community, uh, they may take advantage of this new big box super center that, uh, that is uh, coming in. So probably uh, it's a good opportunity to think about, well, what, uh, what features, what uh, design features or operational features uh, should we be considering? So, Mike, I think, um, uh, I think we've got a, a poll uh, question. Yes. That, uh, if you could bring up the poll question, we're going to simplify it a little bit. Yes, and we have launched the poll question, so uh, we will give everybody time to respond. Yeah, Mike, and again, I apologize, I don't see the poll, but if you could, if you could kind of read it out to me. Yes. I can talk about, uh, help explain what, uh, what, what we're asking for here. Absolutely. So as the votes are coming in, uh, Mark, we do have a question from Mary. She typed in and said, was it a diagram error that the vehicles are driving in the left, or is this an example from the UK? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. You are. Wow. Good. Yes. That is my error. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, good, uh, good catch. Yes, that is my error. We are not in a... Uh, overseas country this is uh, yeah there's not australia or uh or the uk yeah that was my mistake thank you for pointing that out yeah. and mark i think many people are wondering where you found cheap gas <laughs> yeah yeah that uh, that uh, a couple of things i need to change right the direction of the arrows and uh cheap gas although cheap is relative so yeah if it's under five dollars a gallon maybe that's not considered cheap <laughs> Uh, great All right. Stuff. Well, hey, we've got uh, about two thirds of the group has voted. So a few more seconds, and then we will share the results. And and Mike, can you can you read out what the options are that people have? Yes. So option A is put in a signal with permissive left turn phasing. B put in a signal with protected left turn phasing. C put in a roundabout and D, put in a reduced left turn conflict intersection. Great, great. Yeah, now I'm curious to see what the results are. Okay, so here we go. We're going to share the results. And Mark, 8% said A, 52% said B, 21% said C, 
and 19% said D. All right, interesting, interesting spread. So, and again, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. And, uh, but we, we, let's talk about it. So, you know, perhaps a, a roundabout instead of a signal at, at this particular location, well, you know, it, it, it's worthy of, uh, of investigating. Uh, but um, you know, sometimes when we have a, a higher speed four lane a divided highway, uh, yeah, again, it's it's worth uh, worth investigating, but uh, it's interesting that we've had the uh, the protected or the permissive uh, operation. But then there was that last question about the reduced left turn conflict intersection, and uh, I'm sorry, Mike, what was, what was the percentage on that one? Okay, um, for answer D, it yeah. was 19 percent. Ah, okay, okay, all right, well. I, I like uh, I like the at least uh, 19%. So yeah, one great option or uh, or, or great consideration, especially for uh, like a four lane divided highway like this, the reduced left turn conflict intersection. And another thing that I didn't put in the, the question is kind of the uh, uh, the thought of well, should the signal or a roundabout or reduced left turn conflict intersection should it go at this uh, proposed location across from the big buffet family restaurant or should we do something with wheeler road and uh i didn't well i did mention the for sale uh, property uh, across you know part of part of what we uh, uh, perhaps uh, don't do is uh, transportation <laughs> practitioners is uh guess the future but sometimes the, the the future is obvious especially in an area perhaps where we uh, have development that uh, is occurring likely to continue to occur so kind of planning ahead uh what other development is likely what other demands are likely um very frequently we see these uh, four lane divided highways that uh, when there was nothing out there, when it was rural and lower volumes, yeah, things are fine. They operate fine. Uh, but then we start to get development, especially things where we put in a signal. And then we get more development and we put in another signal. And that's when things happen, not just from a safety standpoint, but also from an operation standpoint. So just to put in a plug for the reduced left turn conflict intersections, and I didn't get into a lot of detail on Tuesday, but those can be signalized and unsignalized uh, in, in, in their form. So this is just one example where it kind of uh, cries out for considering a uh, reduced left turn conflict intersection, perhaps something like uh, putting the main intersection at Wheeler Road and uh, maybe uh, uh, locating a, a, a U-turn turnaround further downstream. Uh, maybe making the entrance to the uh, big box super center a, a right in right out uh, type of uh, entrance and same thing for the uh, big buffet family restaurant with a uh, turnaround uh, to facilitate the, uh, the the left turn movements uh, further down so anyway there's a lot to uh, there's a lot of possibilities and uh, so the I'll say default of uh, Yep, putting in a signal, and uh, well, if we are going to put in a signal, yes, protected only uh, might have advantages, but uh, there's other options as well. And then, uh, if we are going to put in a signal uh, and uh, protected or permissive, that is a big decision, but also other things that we talked about uh, on Tuesday included the uh, offset uh, left turn lanes. Uh, so, if we are going to do a permissive operation. Uh, certainly this would be uh, perhaps an opportunity to make sure we at least have offset left turn lanes, good sight distance visibility. They all, uh, they all, they all work hand in hand. Also, uh, even though currently this uh, is perhaps a, a somewhat rural uh, a setting, uh, not to discount or ignore uh, pedestrian crossings. Uh, especially, um, yeah, here's a possible scenario. Uh, people from the senior living community coming to this new big box super center, 
Uh, they may not drive themselves. Uh, perhaps there's a, a transportation that's provided uh, from the, the community itself. And, and it's possible that uh, people may want to walk from the super center to the restaurant or the other way around, maybe have lunch and then go shopping and then get picked up uh, afterwards. There's all kinds of possibilities. So thinking about what would be appropriate for the pedestrian crossing uh, if we are putting in a new signalized intersection. So in this scenario, there's really all, a lot of opportunity to apply uh, the, the recommendations from the handbook. So let me just stop and, and see, Mike, if there's any other questions or comments that were generated from our hypothetical scenario here. Thanks, Mark. Michael wrote, traffic study should be done. Ah, good. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, obviously, if we're uh, putting in a signal, part of that uh, traffic study would be a signal warrant study. Uh, so, but uh, also being open-minded about other options that we have with the type of intersection control uh, that uh, that may be appropriate, not just for the big box super center, but also if we uh, perhaps wanted to make changes at Wheeler Road. All right, very good, excellent. So those were the uh, uh, recommendations. And uh, if we think about that case study, all right, yeah, uh, several folks said, uh, uh, think about uh, perhaps a roundabout, but certainly the reduced left turn conflict intersection. I think that case study almost cries out for uh, the uh, the R cut or J turn uh, type of design. There was no skew uh, there, uh, but uh, things like raised channelization, adequate intersection site distance, uh, those would certainly come into play for that scenario. For signing, marking, and lighting, really all of the recommendations uh, that we talked about uh, could have applicability at that uh, at that scenario. Uh, same thing with a pedestrian crossing uh, at that location. And for uh, for traffic signals, uh, if it is going to be a signal, uh, then certainly the visibility of the signal heads and uh, perhaps the recommendation to go with protected only left turn signal phasing. So that's kind of a, a, a quick and simple example of how the handbook could be applied to a real world scenario. So let's change gears and uh, get away from intersections and uh, move on to interchanges and road segments, which are two other chapters that are in the FHWA handbook. So just like intersections are a particular challenge for older drivers, interchanges are also uh, particularly challenging. The data has shown that drivers over age 75 are overrepresented in crashes that involve merging onto a freeway and where we have weaving operations near interchange uh, ramps, uh, weaving being where a, a lane change uh, has, to, uh, has to be made, judging for a gap in the adjacent uh, lane and uh, safely making that lane change. And then drivers over the age of 70 are also overrepresented in wrong way crashes, where they entered the freeway uh, from a from an exit ramp, uh, so uh, getting uh, going the wrong way uh, up a uh, an exit ramp and uh, getting onto the freeway in the wrong direction. Uh, those types of uh, wrong way crashes on the freeway main line involving high speeds, high energy, and uh, not uh, not easily survivable. Uh, so we do see an overrepresentation in wrong way crashes from uh, older drivers. Uh, also impaired drivers, but there's usually not, not a high level of overlap among those two population groups. So if you look at wrong way crashes that are typical uh, on the freeways, a um, little more than half are, uh, are generally attributed, attributed to uh, impaired drivers, but then about 40% in many areas are, are not impaired, 
but uh, are, they are older uh, drivers that for uh, various reasons uh, went the wrong way down a exit ramp. So some of the things that are in the handbook that are interchange related deal with the acceleration or merge lane design, exit signs and markings, the delineation of the exit, and strategies to uh, try to prevent wrong way entries, and lastly, uh, interchange lighting. So on the entrance ramp to a freeway, there are two basic styles of an entrance ramp, the, the parallel acceleration lane and the tapered uh, design. Now, both are, both are acceptable, both are in common practice, uh, but uh, the acceleration lane, why that is generally preferred, especially for, uh, for the older driver, it, it oftentimes allows a longer distance to judge for a gap, a, a gap acceptance length uh, to make the lane change. But also, compared to the tapered design, the parallel design allows an older driver to make better use of their side view mirrors to help judge that gap in traffic. We mentioned on Tuesday that one of the physical skills that diminishes as we age is our ability to turn our neck or move the upper torso of the body. Well, when people have that challenge to, to uh, fully turn their neck or move the, that upper torso, uh, they would rely more on their side view mirrors to help them uh, make that de determination of if that lane uh, is clear. In the tapered style design, well, that, uh, that side view mirror is, is less effective, the angle uh, that, that it's at. Now, sometimes a tapered uh, design can, can be uh, altered slightly to kind of uh, mimic uh, a, a, a parallel acceleration lane, especially if it's a long taper. So as a minimum, it, it's suggested to at least have a, a longer taper style entrance. But the full recommendation is a parallel style uh, with a adequate gap acceptance length. So an entrance lane length of 1,200 feet. Uh, and then the, uh, the taper at the end of that is generally preferred and it really comes down to the ability to use side view mirrors uh, when uh, someone uh, cannot effectively turn their neck uh, to help them judge for that gap in uh, traffic. Another recommendation is the location of exit ramps and to provide decision site distance in advance of an exit. So decision site distance is longer then stopping site distance. Stopping site distance is the, the minimum requirement, but a decision site distance provides more time for a motorist to either alter their speed or alter their direction to prepare for a, uh, uh, like a lane change or an exiting maneuver. So here you see in the photo an example of horizontal curvature that is blocking the view by the time the sign, and you can just barely make out the taper ahead, uh, not a lot of distance, especially traveling at freeway speeds, to, to make that adjustment. There's also the uh, vertical site distance. If, if there's a crest of a hill that is blocking the driver's view of an exit gore point. So, for example, we might be able to shift the location, elongate uh, the ramp. So it's horizontal. Uh, and uh, and vertical, but the uh, recommendation is to provide decision site distance in advance of an exit. For signing, the optional uh, overhead arrow per lane sign, and uh, this is in the manual on uniform traffic control devices. It was a recommendation in the FHWA handbook. Uh, before it was actually included in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it is based upon research uh, that showed that uh, drivers have a better understanding of the option lane. So if I'm in the, the middle lane here, I have the choice of either exiting or continuing on the freeway. So the overhead arrow per lane signs uh, is a, a recommendation that's been in the handbook for quite some time. 
the use of route shield pavement markings, especially at a major route split. Now, these are becoming more and more popular and uh, the durability has gotten a lot better on, on these as well. It's amazing. Sometimes uh, I've seen where uh, if the pavement is deteriorating, the one thing that is not deteriorating is the pavement under that route shield. Uh, if, if a, a very high durability and uh, now even high friction uh, materials are, are being used uh, for these. So it's helpful. It's one more supplement uh, to help guide a motorist to be in the proper lane, especially when we have some complex geometry or option lanes uh, that, uh, that may split. And exit gore delineation. So in rural areas, perhaps, where we don't have lighting, uh, one thing that can really help identify the gore of an exit and the path of, as someone is leaving the freeway and going onto an exit ramp is the use of raised pavement markers and uh, delineators. Uh, and uh, at night, it can really just help the, the, the exit gore stand out and, and, and be a lot uh, easier to, uh, to navigate, especially in the absence of lighting. And then preventing or trying to prevent wrong way movements. So the handbook talks about the recommendations for supplemental signing, uh, trying to provide signing on the crossroad of, of the intersection of the ramp terminals and the crossroad to help guide motorists into the proper lane for an on-ramp, but uh, help avoid the mistake of going down the wrong way uh, entering on an exit ramp. So doubling up on wrong way signs or larger do not enter signs or the use of pavement markings that include that wrong way arrow uh, on, uh, on the ground. All of these are, are examples. So oversizing, uh, doubling up, using uh, signs on both the right and left side, uh, whatever can be done to help add that conspicuity and, and try to make it obvious that someone is going the wrong way and not just at the intersection itself but then supplemental signing down the ramp so that even if they made the mistake and, and turned down an exit ramp uh, hopefully more signing can uh, perhaps you know, allow the driver to recognize that they are indeed going the wrong way before they reach the freeway. Now, in this photo, you also see that uh, some of these signs are lower mounted. Uh, well, there's a, a reason for that. So uh, sign mounting, uh, typically, uh, especially traditional signs along a roadway, well, there would be uh, pedestrians. And, and uh, so have, having sign heights that, uh, that are uh, clearing uh, for, uh, for not having a pedestrian hit their head, but on an exit ramp, well, you don't have a sidewalk that, that goes down the ramp. You have maybe sidewalks parallel. But lowering the, the sign height is really intended to be in, in a better field of view for where a driver might see it. And also where a driver's headlights at night are going to best uh, light up that sign and have, have the retroreflectivity back. Because most of the time, a wrong way entry is something that occurs at night. In this photo, you see obviously a daytime picture. You see a lot of traffic. Uh, it's uh, almost impossible to, to make that wrong way movement because of all the cars that are basically uh, impeding an opportunity to make a wrong way movement. But change this scenario and make it nighttime and make it where there are no cars that are uh, on the exit ramp. Uh, and so that is where the, the signing really uh, takes over in terms of importance. And the lower sign height, uh, the strategy there is that uh, that sign may be more visible uh, at the lower height because of uh, uh, the, where the headlights would hit it and also just where a, a driver uh, is more likely to be looking. Uh, we mentioned uh, yesterday that uh, the field of view is another important consideration and, and the narrowing of that uh, field of view as we get older. So uh, perhaps even overhead uh, signing. So overhead, doubling up, lower mounting height, the combinations of, uh, of these. So here's another example of oversized 
and also uh, lower mounting height. Again, no sidewalks that are running down the ramp, so a lower uh, sign uh, height, uh, not causing an issue to uh, pedestrians. Using retroreflective uh, markings or uh, raised markings to outline the wrong way arrow, uh, especially with the, the red reflective in the wrong way, and you can have white reflecting in the proper direction, uh, but also that reflective signpost uh, to uh, help the, uh, the wrong way sign uh, stand out. And there are special enhancements that can be made, uh, detectors, uh, microwave detector, detectors, uh, presence detectors of someone going the wrong way on a ramp uh, that could trigger a, uh, an LED light or another flashing a light or just to light up a wrong way sign that might stay uh, uh, blank when there is no uh, someone coming the wrong way. So all of these uh, supplemental enhancements are uh, other possibilities, but it doesn't necessarily require those advanced signing techniques. Something as simple as doubling up, or in this case, uh, tripling up. This is a relatively new design bulletin that uh, was issued by the Florida Department of Transportation and uh, just shows what uh, Florida DOT would now use as a typical treatment uh, for, uh, for signing at, uh, at a freeway exit ramp, uh, very liberal use of uh, wrong way signs and doubling up on the wrong way uh, arrows. Another thing you, you'll see there is the uh, uh, through marking on the crossroad. Uh, to uh, help uh, people know that if you're in that left lane, that that lane is basically a, a through lane through this first intersection. It becomes a, a left turn lane uh, at the downstream intersection to turn onto the freeway. Uh, but uh, just reinforcing not to make a left turn at that uh, uh, intersection where it's an exit ramp and to continue straight through. And the geometry can play a role as well. Raised channelization with angular edges uh, just to help make it more difficult for someone to make a improper left turn to be going the wrong way on the exit ramp. Not impossible, but uh, more difficult and uh, to facilitate the proper left turn movement out of the exit ramp, but make it more challenging uh, to, uh, to make the inappropriate left turn. And then the final recommendation for interchanges is lighting. And um, the Ashto Roadway Lighting Design Guide talks about three levels of lighting, partial interchange lighting, complete interchange lighting, and uh, continuous freeway lighting. And uh, so a uh, uh, general preference, if we had consistency with a, a continuous uh, freeway lighting, but perhaps in, in a rural area, uh, the uh, complete or uh, or at least a partial interchange lighting. But with lighting, one thing it, that uh, is probably uh, as important as the presence of lighting is the uniformity of lighting. And uniformity is, is another measure. From the older driver perspective, we mentioned on Tuesday that one of the challenges the aging population has is that ad adaptivity from darkness to lit areas, uh, but also adapting from a low lit area to a high lit area. So when it comes to freeway lighting and interchange lighting, trying to avoid the scenario where someone is coming from a, say an unlit or a lower lit condition into a very high intensity lighting area. Uh, sometimes uh, there are, we've seen examples of uh, freeway lighting or interchange lighting where it's too bright and uh, especially uh, coming from a darker uh, area. So trying to get lighting but also a reasonable degree of uniformity uh, is also important from the uh, aging driver perspective. And then for roadway segments, uh, I want to talk about uh, two, uh, two, two things that are identified in the handbook, road diets and uh, strategies to prevent rural roadway departures. So road diets, and road diets have been around uh, a while, but it's also 
identified in the handbook is particularly advantageous to the aging population. A traditional road diet uh, takes a, a four-lane undivided road and uh, transforms it. So a, a road diet typically does not involve changes outside of the, the curb to curb roadway width. A lot of times a road diet is something that can be implemented as part of a resurfacing project and then resurfacing and restriping, uh, changing the roadway configuration to, to a, a different uh, use, so perhaps a center two-way left turn lane. So going from four lanes to one lane in each direction with a center two-way left turn lane is a very common type of road diet. But there's other possibilities, uh, putting in bicycle lanes, putting in on-street parking. Uh, a center two-way left turn lane can also allow for putting in a pedestrian refuge island for a mid-block pedestrian crossing. There's all kinds of possibilities uh, for what can be done through a lane reconfiguration project. And that's uh, a, a more technical name. Uh, some folks do not like the term road diet. Uh, I've heard the uh, suggestion that it really should be called a road buffet because what we have is a unlimited choice of options to reconfigure and uh, hopefully improve or rebalance a roadway to better serve the needs of all the users of the roadway. So uh, to me, the, the roadway reconfiguration, the road diet, the safety benefits can really be can be um, thought of in uh, the ways of how it can separate traffic, it can simplify driver maneuvers, and it slows. Separate, simplify, and slow. Well, what do I mean by separate? Well, the two-way left turn lane, if that's one of the items that are that's implemented in the roadway reconfiguration, that center two-way left turn lane is a safety advantage in, in several ways. First, it provides a buffer that separates oncoming traffic directions. And so if for whatever reason, someone just happens to inadvertently uh, leave their lane by a, by a few feet, well, instead of having a oncoming vehicle, uh, that left turn lane can provide a, a buffer space. And, and so whether whether someone is, is distracted for a, a short instance or, or whatever the case is, it can really help prevent what uh, would otherwise have been a head-on collision uh, into hopefully no collision. So it helps provide that buffer separation. But also it provides for a left turning vehicle to be removed from a through lane. So if we take if we think of a four lane undivided roadway and someone making a left turn from that uh, left lane, well, they're basically blocking a through lane and they are at risk of uh, perhaps being rear ended. A center to a left turn lane gets them out of that through lane. So reducing the risk of rear end crashes. It also improves sight lines for left turning drivers. So here's that scenario, the blue car that uh, for whatever reason may have uh, inadvertently uh, crossed the, the center line, but instead of a head-on collision, well, they uh, hopefully just uh, had, a, had some space in the buffer uh, of the two-way left turn lane and uh, perhaps what would otherwise have been a very nasty head-on collision uh, could result in no collision. And getting a left turning vehicle out of the through lane and putting them into a two-way left turn lane. So that's what we mean by separation. And it's also an opportunity to separate based upon user modes. So maybe providing bicycle lanes that uh, weren't previously there or implementing a center two-way left turn lane can give us opportunities for a pedestrian refuge island. A pedestrian could cross now just one direction at a time, one lane at a time. And uh, perhaps also uh, provide accommodations for a better transit uh, service with uh, transit uh, pullout uh, areas. So separation is uh, the separate uh, part of the safety benefits of road diets. 
And then the simplify, part of the, the simplify is the, the sight lines. And if we think about a, a driver wanting to make a left turn, uh, and we mentioned that uh, off, negative offset can, can, can block the view of oncoming traffic. Well, imagine that scenario of two vehicles, the blue car and the green car, both wanting to make a left turn at this minor intersection. Well, they are essentially negative offset from each other, blocking each other's view. If they had the center two-way left turn lane or left turn lanes at this intersection, uh, they are at least not uh, negatively offset. And also, the left turns coming out from the minor street. If we think about someone pulling out from a minor road or a driveway, uh, trying to make a left turn, at a four-lane undivided road, well, drivers have to make a judgment for a gap in the two directions of traffic and two lanes in each uh, direction coming at them. And that, that can be challenging for a driver of any age, but that is another example of a capability that diminishes as we do get older. Uh, research has indicated that most drivers, including younger drivers, have a tendency to underestimate those gaps. And, and by that, we mean the, uh, the actual time of, uh, of when an approaching vehicle would, would conflict, would, would interfere with the turning maneuver. Most of us uh, underestimate what those gaps are. It's hard enough to kind of judge what speed a vehicle is approaching at and uh, really how far away that vehicle is. Uh, and uh, again, that is a classic uh, skill that diminishes as we age. So taking that four lane undivided roadway and oh, another, yeah, another example of a uh, potential problem at four lane undivided roadways. So imagine if someone in the right lane of the four lane road is slowing down to make a right turn into this uh, minor in, uh, roadway or a driveway and uh, we are still that driver trying to make a left turn out from the minor street. Well, we talked about visibility shadows. Well, that right turning vehicle actually casts a visibility shadow of a potential vehicle in the left lane uh, coming uh, toward this intersection. So here's a great illustration in this photo. You see that van slowing down to make a right turn actually has its right turn directional uh, light on and you see the bus behind it and we know it's a bus because you know, it is a, a nice large profile we, we can make it out but imagine this scenario what, what if uh, instead of a bus what if that was a smaller sedan and uh, in approximately the same location so you can just imagine how uh, sometimes a larger vehicle blocks our view of a vehicle in the adjacent lane and so we may think we have a gap we may think oh yeah that van is slowing down to make a right turn i've got a gap well maybe not uh, maybe i can't see that vehicle in the left lane in a road diet where we now only have one lane in that direction we've eliminated that uh, potential conflict so it's a better sight line it's an improved sight line it's a simplified uh, decision made for that uh, left turn vehicle. Another simplified uh, sight line issue is uh, for pedestrian crossings at that minor intersection. So again, this is a case where it's not a signal control. On the picture here on the right, you see the stop sign on the minor street. So this would be a mid-block pedestrian uh, crossing because uh, the major street doesn't have a signal. There's no traffic control device for the major street. And in the photo, you see two pedestrians that have just entered the crosswalk. Uh, there's a bus in the right lane, and uh, yeah, the bus has stopped. Pedestrians are crossing. But I want you to imagine that you are the driver of the black sedan that is next to the bus in this picture. So you're the driver of that black sedan, you're, uh, you're, you're behind the bus further down the road, and you're, you're approaching the bus, you're approaching this intersection, you see the bus stop, or, or slow down and come to a stop in the rightmost lane. 
Now you're the driver of that black sedan. Why would you think the bus might be stopping? Well, when I see a bus coming to a stop, I think, well, the bus is either unloading passengers or picking up passengers at a bus stop. What if the reason the bus is slowing and stopping is yielding to the pedestrians that you see in this crosswalk? And the driver of the black sedan having a different perspective of what's happening and not seeing the pedestrians because the as a driver of that black sedan that the bus is essentially blocking your view of the pedestrians and the driver of that black sedan doesn't stop doesn't see the pedestrians until it's too late that is another real potential uh, challenge the uh, the multiple threat uh challenge where the first car the first vehicle stops to let the pedestrian cross but shadows the view of the driver in the second car and that second car may not stop may not see the pedestrians until uh, until it's too late all of these are sadly all too common safety challenges with four lane roadways uh the, the the statistically speaking four lane undivided roadways are uh, are not the best safety performers uh we have frequent and sudden lane changing a lot of uh, speeding as well uh and so the road diet i'm sorry the, the road uh, diet uh separate simplify but then the last s slow and uh those are the three s's of safety that uh, really uh, work uh, to, to make a, a road diet a, a great uh, a great option for improving safety on, on roads, but particularly for older drivers. And then uh, preventing rural roadway departures. This has been a, a focus of, of the Federal Highway Administration uh, and uh, a lot more detail that, uh, that we now have, but it is, it is a element of the FHWA uh, handbook and when we think about preventing rural roadway uh, departures, we uh, uh, try to put potential countermeasures into three categories to keep vehicles in their lane in the first place. Uh, so things like improved curve delineation, friction treatments and curves, edge lines, shoulder and, and center line rumble strips. Uh, if a vehicle does depart the lane, try to reduce the potential for a crash to occur. So a pavement edge drop off and then a driver over correcting to come back onto uh, the roadway and oversteer, that is a common safety challenge. The safety edge is actually a treatment uh, that helps to avoid a pavement edge drop off uh, and the over correction and allow a driver to more uh, safely uh, come back into the lane or maintaining a clear zone. Uh, so that if a driver does depart the lane, uh, it, at least it uh, hopefully doesn't result in a uh, severe crash and having a traversable roadside slope to avoid a vehicle from overturning. But then if a crash does occur, to minimize the severity, so have breakaway signposts uh, and, and crashworthy uh, devices uh, on the roadsides. So all of these are examples of strategies to help uh, prevent or uh, reduce the severity of rural roadway departures. So keeping vehicles in their lane in the first place, these added uh, or enhanced delineation, uh, enhanced friction, rumble strips, the safety edge, slope flattening, providing clear zones, all of these help reduce the potential for the crash to, uh, uh, to occur. And then lastly, minimize uh, the severity crash-worthy devices. So that is a run-through of, uh, of the recommendations. I hope it wasn't uh, too, too fast-paced. Uh, sometimes it seems like trying to drink a, a sip of water from a fire hose, but uh, there is a lot of good content in the FHWA handbook, and I just wanted to uh, try to uh, get through as many of, of the, uh, the recommendations uh, as, uh, as time uh, permits. So uh, with that, we, we do have uh, time for, uh, for questions. And so, uh, Mike, we can uh, open it up and, and see what, uh, what questions we may have now. Yes, thanks, Mark. So Martha wrote, uh, need to be mindful of traffic volume, VPH, 
since putting all traffic in one lane may reduce acceptable gaps, causing the side street driver to feel compelled to choose a less than desirable gap. Ah, true, true, very true. Uh, but uh, that uh, the, the traffic that uh, that we have on our roadway, and, and yeah, there are there are volume thresholds and some rules of thumb uh, for at least the uh, traditional road diets of uh, four lanes uh, down to say one lane uh, in each direction. But uh, for for whatever volume we may have on a facility, and assuming it's a good candidate uh, for uh, for a road diet, yeah, that's true. But um, taking that same volume. And uh, instead of having it, say, placed over two lanes in each direction, sometimes it's actually simpler when they're lined up in one lane and uh, you can perhaps uh, have better judgments for when a, a safe uh, gap uh, could, uh, could occur. But yeah, under both scenarios, uh, the, no doubt as traffic volumes get heavier, uh, then there's naturally that reduction in available gaps that uh, that is very true all right thanks mark uh, jenny wrote terrific program presenter and facilitator i learned a lot so thank you jenny will it be archived and let me just mention to the group uh, we are recording today's webinar we also recorded tuesday's webinar and we're going to be sending out a follow-up email to everybody with links to those recordings on our LTAP YouTube site. And also, of course, uh, we do have the PDF copy of the presentation available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. And let's see, the questions box is open. So Mark, as we wait for any final questions, is there any uh, items you'd like to sort of recap here at the end? Ah, yeah, thank Mike. Thanks, Mike. So first, I just want to thank everybody for for attending, and the interest in this topic. It is uh, it, it's unavoidable that, that we are an aging society, and in fact, that's a good thing. I kind of like having a birthday every year, and uh, I personally am getting into that uh, that category of uh, getting closer. Not quite there yet, but you know, getting closer to. Uh, uh, what, uh, what could be considered a, an older driver, and uh, it's uh, it, it, it's one last uh, concluding fact, and I mentioned it at the start. All of these things that we talked about, all of these uh, recommendations that uh, can improve safety for the aging population, they really improve safety for everyone. They're, they're really things that uh, cross the spectrum. Uh, the reason we highlight them as part of the handbook and part of this training is that statistically they have a even greater safety advantage for uh, for the aging population. And um, you now, as we as we uh, age, and, and uh, I did mention on Tuesday, it's a emphasis area in the Ohio uh, Strategic Highway Safety Plan. And uh, really, in, in most states, we, we are seeing a, a very strong uh, shift in, in, in the demographics. So it's rare where this is not a, a concern for a state. But um, you know, one, one thing that as we uh, talk about, um, uh, about making uh, improvements and enhancements, uh, it's uh, also, I guess, encouraging uh, that uh, the the aging uh, population and, and uh, again it's, it's an increasing part of the of our percentage uh, out there, uh, but also uh, they they also tend to be folks that uh, are very interested in improvements or enhancements to their community. Uh, that they're they're usually uh, groups that uh, uh, that can uh, have opportunities that you can engage with, and as you explain uh, perhaps some recommendations that are maybe a little different and uh, we talked about roundabouts on Tuesday and uh, even reduced conflict intersections uh, can seem uh, different I uh, guess my advice would be to make sure we, we engage the the older uh, community with that repeated message of why this uh, this is important and it really is about safety it, it is about being able to reduce conflicts, reducing the potential for collisions to occur, 
but then most importantly, when collisions do occur, making them survivable. And um, that, uh, that, that is really a, a key element of this. We, we know that older drivers tend to be safer drivers, that they tend to not exhibit uh, as much of the aggressive behavior that we may see in other demographic uh, gr age groups. But sadly, when older drivers and older pedestrians are involved in collisions, the fatality rate is significantly higher. And it really just comes down to the laws of physics, the kinetic energy, and, and the fact that as we age, we, we do become more frail and underlying health conditions become more prevalent. So most of these safety measures are really taking that perspective that uh, it's about you're trying to avoid the crash in the first place, but then secondly, make them survivable. And um, that is uh, uh, perhaps uh, something that we haven't, uh, or, or a strategy in terms of communications with, uh, with the public that, that perhaps we have not um, fully utilized. And, uh, and I think it is a, a key and important message. So that would be a, another little piece of advice is to perhaps talk differently uh, about uh, highway safety and, and the reasons why certain uh, improvements are, are proposed. Well, thank you, Mark. We have a comment from Nicholas. He said, the message needs to get out to the older population that roundabouts are a safety benefit and provide more education to older drivers on how to traverse through them. Yes, Nicholas, I, I couldn't agree more. And roundabouts are, are a great example of, uh, of a, a intersection strategy that we know is safe. It's proven to be safe. It, it particularly has advantages to, uh, to an older uh, user, older drivers and older pedestrians. Uh, but you are absolutely right in that uh, they, they still continue to be a challenge sometimes from a public acceptance uh, standpoint. And uh, public acceptance uh, across all age groups, uh, really, but um, yes, uh, they are particularly advantageous from a safety standpoint to the uh, older, older user. Very good, very good observation. And uh, uh, persistence and diligence, <laughs> probably the, uh, the the two things that uh, that I would suggest uh, to to keep conveying that message. Thanks, Mark. And I noticed at the beginning of the uh, PDF of the presentation that uh, we have your email address listed. So, is it okay with you if people keep in touch with you if they have additional questions? Ah, absolutely, and thank you for pointing that out, Mike. I appreciate that. That slipped my mind. Yes, by all means, uh, please uh, drop me an email. Uh, I think I've put my phone number in there too, but uh, drop me an email uh, and uh, be happy to, to follow up with, with, uh, with any questions or comments. And uh, as you, uh, I encourage folks to uh, look through the FHWA handbook, uh, download it. It is available for free. And uh, certainly if you have any questions uh, about the handbook, by all means, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. That would be great. All right. Well, I want to thank Mark Doctor for teaching this webinar series. We greatly appreciate it. And thanks so much, everyone, for participating in this course. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.